Good afternoon. Such an obedient group. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christine Shakespeare. I'm Welcome to the University of New Haven. We're really excited to have you here, and the provost would be here, but she had a dental emergency today, so we, we're happy she's not here. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say a few things. I've been part of these conversations for a couple of years. I know certainly Nebby very well over the years, and higher education really needs help identifying high-value emerging skills, developing pathways. Does this sound like a group here? <laughs> Forums and partnerships such as this. Uh, the Tech Talent Accelerator. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of it, and we hope to continue to make change going forward. Um, here at the university, we're really learning about the way to create the, these tra previously traditional credentials and making them more available, quicker to the market, like micro-credentials, credit for prior learning, stackable credentials, which seems, someone like me who works in policy and been out in the field for a long time, very easy. But sometimes we have to really help people get there, and that's why we need a community of practice. Um, they're vital to help us move these very big boats to be responsive to the emerging needs, which are, higher education is just changing so rapidly, I think some of our heads are really spinning. So thank you for taking the time to work on these issues, and we're really grateful to be a part of it at the University of New Haven. We hope to have you back again. Thank you. Uh, Christine, thanks for the welcome and for uh, the kind words uh, about this work. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. I'm Michael Thomas. I'm the head of the New England Board of Higher Education and uh, pleased and uh, certainly privileged to be here with you today. I want to first of all say thanks to our institutional hosts, University of New Haven. Christine, thank you to you and your team. Dr. Mechney, thank you uh, for uh, bringing us all together here. Uh, we're appreciative of your, your, your welcome and kindness and such a great location to bring together our, uh, our leadership and our institutional partners and our uh, employer partners as well. Uh, I think, of course, we want to certainly recognize and uh, thank the continued support of our partners in the state of Connecticut, the Office of Workforce Strategy, and the Department of Economic and Community Development for uh, their uh, trust and support and investment in this work. And I think we also want to say thanks, in addition to our University of New Haven uh, team and host, uh, to uh, the respective teams of the New England Board of Higher Education and the Business Higher Education Forum. So uh, Katie, Leslie, Laura, Candace, Madison, would you stand up and uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks for bringing us together and for making all this run uh, so smoothly. Uh, it, your, your good work makes it easier for all of us. I certainly again want to acknowledge and thank um, all of our institutional partners. Um, and uh, our corporate partners as well. And we know that uh, there aren't any great times for you to be able to get away from the office, get away from the campus. And so uh, we appreciate you. I'm, I'm pretty microphone independent. Yeah. <laughs> no one in my home has ever said, speak more loudly. Uh, <laughs> um, but we want to say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here uh, and for collaborating in this work. Uh, which is absolutely essential. And, uh, you know, the ability to sustain this over time is really what's key and that we think will uh, make a difference. nebby has been really fortunate to work for many years, particularly in partnership with the state of Connecticut. Um, I should have brought it here, but uh, we have a full textbook called Light. Back in the 1980s, we collaborated with uh, people here in the state of Connecticut and the emerging photonics industry to literally write the book on photonics for post-secondary education. And that was sort of the beginning of a number of uh, partnerships and connections that actually have led to uh, this current work, but fundamentally, again, uh, the pattern of bringing post-secondary institutions uh, and curious and engaged faculty members like yourselves with uh, innovative uh, business and industry partners to make things happen and respond to high demand talent needs around uh, the region or really around the United States. Uh, Christine mentioned she knew something about Nebby. I don't know how true that is for most of you, but uh, we were formed back in the 1950s by the governors and the 
legislators of the six New England states, and we were really built to be a collaborative platform, if you will, an intermediary entity to help individuals work across institutions and across state borders and across industries and sectors on important issues related to higher education, uh, talent, and economic growth in the region. And our mission is really to advance equitable education, particularly post-secondary education outcomes across the whole of the, uh, the, the region. And I think we would all agree that equitable higher education opportunities really culminates in equitable participation in the economy. And it's hard to do that without emerging skills and without uh, adequate experience and on-ramps to growing areas of the economy. So this work really strikes at uh, that important uh, work. Uh, there's lots to be said and lots to do here, so uh, I'll just simply again say thank you. Look forward to conversations with you uh, before the day is over. I also want to recognize and thank and acknowledge our panelists as well from whom we look forward to hearing. So I'm going to turn now the time to Katie Singer from the NEVI team. Thank you. Um, my name is Katie Singer. I'm the Director of Policy and Research for the New England Board of Higher Education. And I've had the great honor to work with several members of the audience today over the last year and a half um, related to the Tech Talent Accelerator. And I'm not going to spend much time up here, but just quickly, today we have two parts. Um, the first part where we get the chance to hear our booster grantees and what that means is this is a second phase that we're in for the Tech Talent Accelerator. Um, last year we started the first phase and the six independent institutions that were awardees of that first phase are now booster grantees for this second phase of 2.0. And so they've been doing this work for the last year. So today we want to spend the first half learning a little bit more about that work and have an open discussion after their, their presentations and let those current and new grantees ask questions, business partners ask questions um, of each other so that we can continue this community practice and learn from each other. Um, and then the second part, we're going to have the opportunity to hear more about the work that's going across the state of Connecticut with our esteemed guests and panelists that we have today. And we'll do more of an introduction for that later this afternoon. And so, um, Madison, if you want to do the next slide. One more. I didn't want to, I'll go ahead and start and let Karen here at Mitchell College kick us off um, with our first presentation. Okay. Hey. Hello friends and new friends. Uh, I understand I have five minutes, so I'm going to jump straight into it. Uh, we started in the first grant by using the support of uh, the Tech Talent Accelerator to really build our infrastructure and foundation for a new continuing education online professional development initiative at Mitchell College. Uh, it is both online and professional development were new, our new spaces for us, so this was a chance to really do some of that exploration with a focus on supporting cybersecurity and technology in kind of the, the military space in our area. Uh, after uh, doing a lot of that internal work, I was also doing a lot of conversations with businesses and uh, business organizations in the area. And what I started to hear over the course of the year was that while skills are important, and certainly certifications are important, it was also really important, perhaps even more important, that these organizations needed help building up the professional skills of their staff or incoming people, that they were saying their biggest pain points were having a shared understanding of what it meant to be a professional, a working employee. And while I thought, I'm not sure I can build a course that does that, because I don't know that people would take it, we did think it was an opportunity for Mitchell to really find something unique for us. Mitchell is known for having a very person-first and inclusive approach to teaching. And so we decided in year two to really embrace that part, that strength of ours, and focus on building courses that looked at building neuroequity within organizations. So we're, this year we're working with an industry partner who has, whose president or founder um, self-identifies as being autistic and is committed. As some of you met him at our last session. He's very committed to increasing inclusivity in the workplace, in technology, and so we're building a new course that looks at that topic, at neuroequity in the workplace, as well as some professional skill building that are designed with neuroequity principles, but are really open to anybody to build strengths in, in those skills that are particularly relevant in the tech industry, such as collaboration, communication, time management, those kinds of things. And so that's really been our journey, has been to start by just building the boat and then figuring out what kind of places people need us to take that boat. 
I think our biggest challenges going forward with this kind of new additional direction, you know, we're still doing the other thing, but we're also doing this new thing, is having that initial conversation, right? Demonstrating to organizations and businesses that there is both need and value in having conversations about neurodiversity and neuroequity in the workplace. Uh, and that really working with our partner to both make sure that the course that we're building is authentic, right? That by working with the community, it brings both validity to the work as well as giving us important feedback. And then they are also planning to provide both beta testing and then communication and connection and promotion of the course within their networks in addition to ours. So that's really our journey of the last couple of years. And it's certainly been uh, through the both um, enthusiastic and strategic support of the TTA team that we've been able to move this far. I don't even know what I did one time. That's my thing. Thank you. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've learned so much through TTA over the past year and happy to be part of TTA 2.0. So I thought I would share um, a little bit about what we've done. I think several people have said I can't go over five minutes, but anybody who knows me, I, do, I never go over five minutes. <laughs> so anyway, so I, I'm trying, so I want to talk a little about cybersecurity, a little about what we did in TTA 1.0, and then what we're planning to do in 2.0. So my big, the, the thing that's upsetting most to me is that cybersecurity controls really aren't working after all these years. So I want to talk a little bit about the history, what we need to do, how TTA is helping solve this problem, and also some of the things that we did. And I, I even have a couple of gotchas, things that didn't work out so well, and I have some questions too. Maybe we can have that for the uh, Q&A part, but go on, could go on to the next part. So, so this is, uh, we, we did some analysis of breaches in 2022 in Connecticut. We got some data, and my colleague Robin Chateau um, did this, and I guess it's really hard to read there. All you can do is see the total. I have my cool slide thing here, if it works. My cool pointer. Yep, so you can't, and it doesn't reflect off of that, so okay. <laughs> no worries, take it back. It's um, cool. Yeah, <laughs> but this, so there were 1,582 breaches in Connecticut in 2022. And I've been in this field long enough, you know, like 15, 20 years, there was a time when you could not find a breach. If you wanted to write a paper or an article, there was nothing to write about. And I'm, this, is, this is the way it was. And now look at this. This is crazy. So let's go on to the next slide. So we, and I, I remember this breach. How many people remember the Choice Point breach, 2005? This was one of the first big breaches. And it's interesting to me because it was really a business type breach. It wasn't, oh, I'm gonna hack into a server or a network. It was hacking into a business. And their business partners basically hacked into choice point and stole information. And so I, I think what I've tried to do in our TTA programs is focus on business risk and not just the technical risk. So I think that's what we need to do. So anyway, let's go on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this whole idea of business alignment is really what TTA is all about, right, in terms of developing the content. And so we picked three areas to work in, cybersecurity and healthcare, cybersecurity fin in fintech, and then penetration testing, which really covers a lot of different areas. And so, um, you know, we use the TTA game plan, which is close collaboration with business partners, and so I think I think that what we're going to end up with and what we have ended up with is content that's really industry specific as opposed to just generic security. So that's kind of the message. And let's go on to the next one. So we did launch our course in cybersecurity and healthcare. We ran it last fall, 2023. We did, uh, we've taken these to the level where we can issue a Quinnipiac branded uh, badge. And so that's an example of what it is. And and I'm excited about it because like two weeks ago, Health and Human Services launched this new set of performance goals for healthcare. And this is exactly what we're going to roll into our next training program in TTA 2.0. And so, okay, here's a gotcha. I put one gotcha. One problem, we, we developed the detailed KSAs, right? That's part of the TTA methodology. And so I did that. And then I put... The, those uh, KSAs in the description for the badge. Hi. And what I found is that 
it's then hard to change the badge. You know, if you change the course a little bit, you have to go back and change the whole thing over again. I have to go through the badge committee. So, I'm serious. So what you have to do is make your KSAs, you know, specific but not too specific. That, that's what you have to do for this. So that's what I learned on that one. And then on the next one, um, uh, the penetration testing course we also run last summer. It's running again now. It's really popular and we also have um, a badge for that. And so I'm, I'm working in, with partners to try to make it more real world and, and, and uh, have it be uh, something that a, a business, you know, penetration testing is all about mitigating risks in the business and explaining it to the business and not just running a tech program. So that's what we're going to do on the continuous improvement part of that. And then the last one, the FinTech one, it's still under development, this, this whole industry is uh, so broad, so I'm trying to connect with other fintech partners, they're fintech vendors, uh, they're fintech startups, they're banks, every bank is trying to incorporate fintech. So I'm working on that and I have also been <clears throat> waiting a little bit because our business school just launched a fintech program, not fintech cybersecurity, but fintech per se, so we want to partner with them. So, and then I think my last slide, um, yeah, this is kind of what we want to do um, in this, in TTA 2.0. And the last thing down at the bottom, again, you can't read that, but it's evaluate outcomes. So I'm still researching exactly how to do that, and maybe we can talk about it. We have our lifelong learning group evaluates outcomes. We have our career uh, folks evaluate outcomes. So I'm trying to figure out exactly who's going to be best suited to do that, and uh, sort of meet the needs that the state has. So that's it. Thank you all. <clears throat> yes. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Julie Demers, and I am the Director of Grants, Maria Gums. We are from the University of Bridgeport. And when we received our TTA grant in the fall, we created three online courses um, cybersecurity. They were at the 500 level, they were distance learning. And uh, we allowed, we had 129 people interested in the program, but we could only offer 30 slots. And uh, it was a 12-week intensive, so these three courses were running simultaneously. And the students really had two hours of class time in the evenings, and then they had homework. And the homework was based on a test out, the lab sim, so they were really following the modules, taking the quizzes, finishing up the assignments. And so at the end of this 12-week period, we offered a certificate of course completion. And the way that we said what is the value add for spending all this time on this program is that um, you now have the knowledge, skills, and the um, hands-on practice of cybersecurity, network design, and ethical hacking. Now, if you wanted to invest in taking the actual certification test, um, that's on them. And so there were a couple of students who were like, you know, uh, that, that's a constraint, uh, which is one of the things that we realized. Um, and so fast forward to the TTA 2.0. Maria, do you want to say how we changed it? So we slightly altered it. We continued to offer the three courses that Julie mentioned, but we added an advanced course. And what this advanced course was for were for the students who completed all three courses in the fall. <coughs> So once those students had completed all three courses, then they were now eligible to take this advanced course. We were also going to offer it to students who had some knowledge of cybersecurity, more so than somebody coming in without any experience or knowledge of it, and they would also have the ability to take the course. And what we did was, again, offer it 30 slots for the three courses, and then we offered 15 slots for the advanced course, which is offered now in the spring and will be offered again in the fall for the students who complete the three course spring semester and graduate. Julie mentioned that you know if you complete it, you get a completion of certificate, but each of those students who completes one of the courses, they will get a certificate of completion for each of those courses. If they complete all three of them, they will get a certificate of completion for all three. So, at the end, someone can end up with four certificates of completion, and if they go on to the advanced course, they will get an additional one. And we engaged our business partner. She's actually a woman-owned business in Hartford, um, and Cherie 
Psychotech. Um, and so she actually thought this was a wonderful way to have her, her employees upskilled because she pays thousands of dollars to be able to have them go through this. So imagine in a 12 week, over a 12 week period, these employees now have the skills that they can go right into her, um, into her company and help, uh, help out with that. So Cherie is actually um, helping out by being present during some of our classes to present to the students what are the opportunities and job internship um, that's available to them. Um, and just, it's great because of the diversity of the students that we have. We have some officers from the Bridgeport Police Department, New York Police Department. Um, we did offer it to our UB students and alumni because we have a high population of computer science. Um, and we're just really finding out that, you know, there's a lot of interest and needs. People are concerned because they don't have that technical background. Um, but Cherie helps to help, you know, kind of manage that and, and explain what are the pathways. And what also Cherie does is, uh, as well as sending her employees, current employees, to the program, she also offers opportunity to hire individuals that we train into her company. So it's a win-win where, you know, we're developing the employees she needs, as well as we're training her current employees. So it's a match where we're helping her fill the voids that she has in the job market, as well as training her current employees. And, um, you know, Julie mentioned the diversity of our students. Um, UB is a very diverse university. We have students from 45 different states, eight different countries. Our BIPOC population is 73% of our student population. So when we talk about diversifying the industry and the market, UB is a perfect place and a perfect example of that and what we're trying to do. And the last thing, other hat that I wear is dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment. Um, and so there is a Bridgeport school that has a cybersecurity course for high schoolers. And so we're going to have conversations, you know, maybe they can't operate at a 12 week level, but we'll see what that will morph into because I think building the pathway at that age is actually a wonderful thing to continue to fill that gap. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I guess it's uh, going to be my turn. So my name is Mehdi Mekni. I'm Associate Professor of Computer Science, Software Engineering, and uh, Cybersecurity here at the University of New Haven. Today I'm going to talk in five minutes, and trust me with time, I'll tell you when the five minutes are over. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about my project entitled Embedding Unity Credentials to Catapult uh, Connecticut Game Design and Development uh, Workforce. So uh, the motivation behind the, uh, the project was actually uh, I would say the key word is alignment. I have had a um, game uh, design and development experience with Ubisoft uh, in my uh, early age. And uh, I got hired in 2020 by the University of New Haven to develop a game design and development concentration. And uh, one year after we started the, uh, the uh, concentration, which composed uh, uh, five courses that you see aligned there, uh, we received this uh, wonderful opportunity to get funded in order to embed uh, IRCs in the, in the program. Uh, so it was like a perfect alignment, personal interest, institutional uh, uh, interest, and uh, regional impact with the, uh, uh, partners, as you can see. Uh, we thought about the project, how we can uh, leverage what Unity uh, technologies are offering in terms of uh, credentials and certifications, and how we can embed or basically interject those uh, certifications within existing four credit courses without adding uh, uh, basically uh, burden, financial burden on the students. Uh, in order to go or to undertake that journey, I uh, got the chance to have three wonderful partners, um, Surgeon, uh, Pleiadian System, and Arsum. I usually come to these meetings with at least one industrial partner. This is the only time I didn't get the chance to have one of them represented here. But, uh, I mean, they, they are supporting our, our uh, project uh, at different levels, and I will talk, talk about that. So the need for uh, actually qualified talents uh, in game design and development raised when I was hired by uh, uh, Ubisoft. We usually spend six months in internal training in order for us to be able to be effective and productive in terms of, uh, um, you know, producing and, and contributing to projects and, pro and products. Uh, we wanted to lift that burden off the shoulders of uh, industrial partners and to bring it to the university where we are good at 
and give them not only the academic credentials, as I said, but also uh, uh, industry recognized uh, um, recognition or credentials uh, under their belt upon graduation. Uh, that's basically the solution that we proposed uh, to embed those uh, Unity credentials into the existing uh, computer science uh, game design and development concentration. Uh, the journey in TTA uh, uh, 1.0, the first year, was not easy. It was uh, uh, exciting uh, working with CEOs uh, in, uh, in uh, medium scale companies. It's not uh, easy uh, having their, uh, their, um, their time. Their contribution, you have to be a lot of, I mean, you have to be flexible, uh, uh, plan ahead of time, a lot of time, uh, give them, uh, you know, uh, uh, enough of space in order for them to give you that feedback that we are working on uh, in order to collect those KSA uh, uh, um, metrics or indicators for, for the different courses that we, we revised. Uh, we are trying to uh, work on you know, uh, going beyond the University of New Haven. We are not the only one claiming or looking for developments of uh, uh, game design and development workforce uh, uh, pool of talents here in the region. And we wanted to create that collaboration. It's not easy, I'll talk about it. We, we initiated actually discussions with the, um, with the uh, community colleges state level, uh, um, let's say um, institution or, or representative. And we are in close talks with, uh, with the Manchester Community College because they have already a game design and development associate degree. Uh, the project sustainability, uh, currently uh, Unity uh, credentials are not for free. And the, the major bulk of the funding that we are receiving from the uh, uh, Tech Talent Accelerator program is basically used in order to pay for that membership to Unity Academic Alliances, which allows us as an institution to use a certain envelope of uh, credits to pay, or let's say to offer vouchers for our students to first uh, um, get uh, practice tests, and second, to pass the test. Uh, if they fail the test, they have a second time for free, and then if they are committed to take that course, and uh, that uh, certification, and you have to support them, you basically start over again and you lose those credits. They are a number of 80. Uh, we got lucky. Uh, so far we have over 22 students who got uh, certified. Uh, four of them got two levels of certifications. As you can see, there are like uh, 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 introductory, intermediate, and advanced. So we have uh, uh, um, introductory and intermediate only so far, which is, I mean, I, I honestly, I didn't uh, even expect the intermediate, but uh, that shows a level of commitment of the students. But once the uh, TTA is over, uh, a big question mark on uh, how we can sustain that. Is it going to be additional fees on the tuition, a kind of a lab fee, we call a certification fee when the students register, which is the least appealing uh, solution? Uh, will we be able to create uh, a probably industrial alliance with our partners and other partners in order to sustain the projects? Those are things that we are working on uh, uh, as we speak. Uh, the industry partner engagement and contributions, of course, uh, uh, a lot of uh, meetings and follow-up meetings and, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, gentle assignments that, uh, you know, we send them, we would like to have your feedback about these materials, and then you follow up, and then you, uh, you cancel a few meetings because they are not available, and then finally you get that valuable feedback and thumb up. Uh, the internship opportunities, this is something that I'm excited about because I was able to place actually our students in the three companies, and... Uh, out of the four students who worked on the Sphere Gen uh, and uh, Pleiadian, uh, sorry, out of the six students who worked on the Sphere Gen and Pleiadian, four of them did the following pathway. So they did semester one, semester two, final year or senior year capstone project, summer internship, and as we speak, four of them are actually working with uh, Pleiadians as uh, basically software developers. Uh, um, not full-time employee because of the size of the company, but they are kind of freelancer, open contract, which is a good start. We are waiting for a probably substantial contract that might happen uh, very soon in order for the company to, you know, uh, scale up a little bit and those students become full-time, hopefully. I, call, I keep calling them students. They are not. <laughs> they are graduates. Uh, <laughs> Collaboration, of course, they came to my classes for several times for, for guest uh, lectures, talking about their businesses, the importance of game design and development, and so on. 
And finally, uh, the rearward projects for Capstone were amazing. Having my students working on a platform, like for example with Pleiadian, to train firefighters and force uh, responders using virtual reality. It's, uh, it's the type of uh, experiences that n is not common, not all students can have, and having that on their resume uh, and build those uh, technical skills is, uh, is crucial. The final uh, point, TTA 2.0, uh, objectives comparing to 1.0, uh, we feel that 1.0 was a successful journey already with those credentials that we were already able to uh, offer to the students, the students who obtained those uh, certifications, the implementation, the revision of the program, and the partnership with Unity and the other uh, uh, industrial partners. Those are the main outcomes of 1.0. 2.0 is under the uh, uh, banner of scalability. We want to scale. We want to scale the number of uh, uh, industrial partners and we are in touch with two new partners. We want to scale up also our level of commitments and partnership with Unity. And finally, as I said, we are working with uh, uh, Manchester uh, Community College and other community colleges in order to create that pathway that was listed under challenges, but we are still working on it. Would it be ready by the end of the terms? Uh, 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 I mean, effective time of, of TTA 2.0, question mark, but we are working on it. That's pretty much all of my talk. Thank you for your attention. All right, so my name is Hong there. So I'm from University of St. Joseph. So we are doing data analytics. And then right now, we're also included in like machine learning, and then we're trying to do cloud computing, too. So this TTA 1.0 and 1.0, 2.0 there together. So, um, of course, we try to serve the data analytics needs in CIT. So, the TTA 1.0, what we did most is to embed Google Data Analytics Professional Certificate in three computer science courses, and then later we embed that in one business administration course. Um, so, TTA 1.0 is very much supported by CGI. So, we have like Stephen. I don't know how to speak his last name, sorry. So he's a VP of CGI in Hartford. Um, of course, he also still support our, our TTA 2.0, OK? So TTA 2.0 will try to serve like a data analytics, AI, and cloud computing. And also, we still embed Google's data analytics certificate in more courses. And one big change we do is we align existing courses with a, AWS and slash machine learning university. These are two organizations in Amazon, but they try to offer the course together. Also, also develop new courses, and uh, all this is supported by CGI. So the idea to jump into Amazon is that we think that you know Amazon is very well known for their um, cloud computing, their AWS, and also their they have a machine learning university, which is doing very, very good job right now. So we try to collaborate, collaborate with them. And I think it works out well. So here are some challenges I'm going to talk about. I think it's kind of interesting part, OK? So embedding the certificate in courses is a uh, it's not difficult, basically. We know those skills. We just talk about those skills in courses. But then the challenge comes from after the courses. Uh, this is a professional certificate. Students have to spend extra time to get the certificate if they want to do so. And that uh, you know, many students don't want to because uh, they, they don't have the, that much time after classes time. So, what we did is we get a support from TTA from New England Board of Higher Education. So we got a, the solutions to offer students a $400 award to complete the Google certificate. And then, uh, by the way, a big part of the fund is spending on those like a course license, those kind of things. And then eventually, with this award, then among 20 students last year involved, then six students get the certificate. Uh, three out of computer science major, one of math major, but data science minor, and two business majors. So eventually that award motivated students. 
So in TTA 2.0, so I, I didn't expect the, the number of students to participate in the certificate double this year. So then I just suddenly found, oh my god, I, I didn't apply enough fund for that part. <laughs> uh, what to do? So solution, of course, fortunately last year we had like a $4,000 we didn't spend. So New England Board of Education approved that we could you know, continue to use it. So we put that money into the use and also we, right now I try to postpone the purchase of some license so that it, just postpone one month so I would get a, a cheaper deal so I could finish it, finish it. So there will be other challenges that are coming in academic, such as a new course, curriculum, approval, just like a lawyer, lawyer was talking about, right? So uh, whenever there's a new course, you have to go through that. Uh, like in our university, department has to approve that. Usually that's no problem, but then UCC and then go to faculty, whole faculty meeting, so to get approved. So, most of the time, it's not a big deal, but then sometimes you may run into trouble anyway. But the most challenging part, which I didn't say, show here, is that sometimes if the course, there's not enough enrollment, the course may or may not be offered. So that's some challenging I may be facing in the coming four semesters. So it's like a, like a, I'm going to offer the cloud, cloud computing from Amazon AWS, but then I don't know how many students dare to take that course. So, so I, oh, oh, I still have one more slide. All right, so the support from CGI is very solid and great. So we have a lots of email communication, remote video communication, and uh, there are two CGI VPs, and uh, our, both their VPs are all on our program advisory board members. So they always come to our university, attend the meeting, now, Stephen came to USJ campus and gave our student a lecture, and uh, he already agreed to give another lecture in this spring. We're still trying to schedule out a specific date. And so that's, uh, they're very supportive. Next slide, I think I have one more slide. Yeah. So anyway, so through the case, uh, a mapping between USJ and CGI, so we identified some critical skills needed in certain business. Lots of, lots of information from CGI, like they need Python, cloud computing, JavaScript, virtualization, and other software, software skills. So that's why we jump from, when we jump from TTO 1.0 to 2.0, we take their suggestion. We wanted to have what? Cloud computing, or we wanted to also, oh, that's one thing, all right? So also we emphasize JavaScript in web courses and uh, we make a presentation in every course, ask students to make a presentation so that they could uh, practice those software, soft skills like uh, CGI wants. I have so many slides I didn't ex expect, okay. <laughs> uh, also, CGI is so supportive. See, last year, they offered three internships for, for my students, and then they continue, they will continue this summer. From last meeting, I think Katie was there, like Steve said, uh, he put my students at the top lab because they think, uh, you know, because after we take their feedback, uh, we specifically train our students that way. So he, based on his talk, that uh, our students had the best performance in the summer intern. So that's why they wanted them back. So the last sentence is a case meeting, case map, mapping meeting with CGI really helped us to move forward and upscale our program. So I really want to thank to the TTA grant, which really helped us. I think that's it, that must be. Yeah, thanks. I hope that was a nice break. Okay, so we're gonna get started with our panel. We wanted to highlight some workforce development initiatives that are complementary to the Tech Talent Accelerator, including the Good Jobs Challenge and um, Campus CT and more. Many of you um, have been asking us about the sustainability or other funding um, opportunities to help sustain your projects in new ways, and so we hope to not only answer some of those questions, but also hear a little bit more about 
what the business community is saying about their need for tech talent, um, how the state is trying to retain graduates in Connecticut and not send quite as many to New York City or Boston. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, we want to give you some ideas too for potentially some additional um, enrollment pipelines. So joining us today, we have Patricia Meyer, who's the director of the Good Jobs Challenge program at the Stanford Partnership. She has a long history of overseeing workforce development in the community college context. And she comes to the Stanford Partnership um, as a previous co-convener of the Eastern Connecticut Healthcare Partnership. We also have two folks from Advanced CT, Lisa Mercurio, Mercurio, sorry, it's hard to say that for me coming from Maine. <laughs> Mer Mercurio, <laughs> Vice President of Business Development at Advanced CT. She's responsible for ongoing communication with economic development partners throughout the state and the management of business expansion and retention projects. She's previously held roles with the Connecticut Small Business Development Center and the Business Council of Fairfield County. So she might have some ideas for you for business partners as well. <laughs> and Patricia, Patricia Zajak, who is an economic development specialist with Advanced CT. She's part of the business retention expansion, expansion team as well and collaborates closely with businesses in the state to identify successes, address challenges, and provide strategic resources and support for continued growth. She's also the program associate for Campus CT, which is an initiative led by Advanced CT under the Governor's Workforce Council. So I'm going to kick us off by just asking um, Patricia Meyer and Lisa to tell us each about the sort of mission and goals of your organization and shed some light on how they might align with the Tech Talent Accelerator. I'll have Lisa kick us off. Oh, sure. um, hi, I'm Lisa Mercurio, and um, we, so Advanced CT is a not-for-profit economic development organization. We are funded in part, uh, by 50% 50, 50 in part, by the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development, 50% by private sector. It's a, a model that, um, uh, in terms of economic development, that has worked well throughout the country um, when this uh, organization was launched about four years ago. Um, there was quite a bit of, uh, of uh, best practice looked at what was happening throughout the country in terms of economic development when it's separate from the state. So we feel that we're, we're served by a board of um, private and, and the state which is a really healthy balance um, in the discussion of business retention and business attraction to the state. Um, as I mentioned, we were started four years ago um, under the current uh, administration. They just felt there was some extra capacity for the state to promote and increase the awareness of Connecticut and all that Connecticut has to offer, key of which is our workforce and our quality of life. So um, we actually are divided into two um, sort of deployment teams, a business attraction team, and a business retention and expansion team. Uh, Patricia and I serve on what we call the VRE team. Um, business attraction is very, very uh, clear. We um, look to recruit businesses to the state nationally and internationally. We align with the key industry um, sectors that the state uh, is sort of pr pursuing on a strategic level, and that would be life sciences, advanced manufacturing, finance and insurance, and renewable um, technology. And technology, obviously, is woven into all of these uh, industries. On the BRE side, we're industry agnostic. We meet, our goal is to really meet with all businesses throughout Connecticut to help them uh, connect to resources they need to grow. So whether they be um, looking for sites uh, selection within the state if they're trying to expand or to adapt to new models, um, workforce has become the predominant uh, requests that we get, as well as any resources that the state might have, um, equipment uh, grants for manufacturing, um, training grants for manufacturing, as well as um, additional resources based on, you know, if you're looking to grow your business, the state does have some incentives based on the size of companies, that, uh, size of the employees that you're looking to hire. So um, why, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, predominantly workforce when we meet with businesses is a key, uh, a key um, request for assistance. And on our team, uh, serving, there's four of us on our team, is a workforce specialist, 
and she's actually works directly with the Office of Workforce Strategy and um, statewide uh, is connected through the various um, regional sector partnerships. I don't know how well we know that term um, in the audience, um, but so depending on the regions um, within the state, there's a focus on tech or healthcare uh, or advanced manufacturing. And um, like, like just out of, which I always find fascinating, um, the RSP and sort of the Bridgeport, Fair, you know, Southwest area, um, there are 300 manufacturers in Fairfield County, which is amazing, you know, UB would know that. So it's always amazing, and I'm from that area, and it was amazing to me how many. So I think my point is that the RSPs have really sort of opened up what, uh, what our businesses look like and the skills that they need, and then, you know, on the manufacturing side, it is advanced. And, and our, you know, we'll get into it, but, um, you know, people are looking for engineers. They're looking for math and, and strong engineering skills. So um, we, so Alicia interfaces with us when we go out to businesses, we get an assessment of what the business is looking for, and then as, as our workforce specialist, Alicia comes in to sort of map out um, you know, a, a plan for them to either be introduced to various partners to allow them to hire the workforce that they need. So I don't want to go into too much, but I'll, I'll end there. Oh, sure. Yeah, let's take a second to turn those mics on. And Lisa did a great job setting up for Patricia Meyer to talk about what a regional sector partnership is and how it in, how it plays in the workforce ecosystem. So Patricia oh, Meyer, off to you. <laughs> Not often do you get two Patricia. I know. So, it's is, um, so um, Stanford Partnership is a um, what would be a backbone organization in the sector partnership model. Um, State of Connecticut. I'll, I'll give a little bit more background to sector partnerships and then go into what our mission and goals are in the tech sector partnership in Southwest Connecticut is. So. Um, the state of Connecticut uh, has been providing a lot of supports for regional sector partnerships, a specific model that engages businesses to define the uh, businesses within a sector to define the challenges that they have within the regions that they are in. Um, and throughout Connecticut, I believe there are about 12 of them. There's two tech sector partnerships, Southwest Connecticut Capital Region. Um, and as a backbone organization, Stanford Partnership has been the convener of businesses for the past couple of years. And the Good Jobs Challenge Grant is a um, strengthening sector partnerships initiative, which helps provide some funding to, to, for us to build structural supports for sector partnerships. Sector partnerships as a term, a concept, um, is usually a volunteer-led, organization-driven, um, nobody owns it type of idea, right? And, and really wanting businesses to come to the table to say, these are the challenges that we're facing, that I'm facing as a business owner. Let's come together and find solutions. And organizations like Stanford Partnership, um, workforce boards, um, institutions of higher education, uh, work around them to support idea finding and solutions. So it's it's not uh, it's a it's a new spin on a um, an industry advisory committee type of um, structure that has been around for a long time. Um, and in Southwest Connecticut, um, with the Good Jobs Challenge funding, uh, what we're able to do is, and what the businesses have identified as areas of focus, is really community building around the tech sector. Um, so what we're focused on is um, finding ways to engage businesses um, by providing special topic seminars, workshops, things along those lines, um, trying to cultivate uh, this sector partnership as a space for businesses to come. I have a problem, who can help me figure out a solution in the tech sector? We, we seek to be that place where they can come and engage with their peers and then we support them in finding solutions for the challenges. Workforce is usually at the center of these um, sector partnerships, but it doesn't just have to be um, workforce and talent development. Um, and that's been the case with the Southwest Connecticut Tech <coughs> Sector Partnership. The, there is an interest in supporting K-12 um, curriculum support, career pathways, um, but with the changes in the tech sector with regards to employment and layoffs and all of these things, that's a really big impact. 
and that's one that we hear loud and clear in Southwest Connecticut, it's not the same conversation that the tech partnership is having in, in Hartford. The capital region has separate goals than we do and has a separate um, industry engagement level or industry engagement at the table. So it's, it's really kind of fascinating. Um, and that's really the core of the sector partnership. Instead of having a Connecticut tech sector partnership, you really need it to be regional um, because the challenges that the businesses are facing are regional um, as opposed to specific to the state. Um, so our goals, um, as I said, community engagement, finding a place, being a place for businesses to uh, find, to voice challenges and find solutions, um, building a um, tech talent partnership. Right now we have funding for um, short-term training programs and we'll talk a little bit later about uh, partnerships with um, other institutions of higher education, um, but really kind of creating an ecosystem where those connections between K-12 and higher ed and business start being formed if they're not already there. That's really where a lot of the interest our employers have in, in engaging in um, sort of a talent pipeline initiative. And then uh, a third focus of ours is really kind of finding this a sustain sustainability model for a sector partnership idea, right? We, we want to be a tech hub in Southwest Connecticut. Stanford Partnership wants to be the center of that hub and they're doing a lot around that, but how do we engage other partners, and, how do, and, and what are the aspects of a tech hub that make us a viable tech hub, right? So those are the questions that we have before us. Thanks, Patricia, that was really helpful, and I think worth noting that many of your uh, business partners, as you already know, are also members of one of the two tech regional sector partnerships, and are often um, in the room hearing about your work when it's shared in that venue and, and talking to their peers about it. And Karen gave a great example of how the regional sector partnership led to her industry partnership as well. So Lisa, we'd love to hear about when you go out and connect with business leaders in Connecticut, what tech skills needs are they talking about and what do you hear them looking for in partnerships with higher education institutions? I do want to apologize that, that our workforce specialist, Alicia, I guess, is not able to join us. So she is definitely the, um, the key uh, receiver of that information. But um, what essentially we, uh, Patricia and, and our team, um, are the first sort of points of contact with employers. And, and, and again, it's geography um, throughout the state and it's industry agnostic. And um, what we intend to do is find out what their what their sort of pressure points are, um, what they're looking to achieve. Usually, it's in a very quick turnaround. Um, and if workforce is something that they've highlighted with us, then we will bring in um, Alicia to sort of really she will then work with the employer to get a sense of what specific skills are being um, sought and what level of um, is it someone early in their career is it mid level. Um, anecdotally, uh, Alicia has shared with me on, on tech talent specifically, um, in the past year she has not had a, um, a tremendous amount of requests for that. Um, employers seem to be finding the talent they need uh, through a variety of means. Um, I, but what she has heard and what we hear all the time um, are the needs for engineers. And so a lot of um, smaller firms that we work with, there are a lot of life sciences, a lot of manufacturing firms, um, and, and actually in the renewable energy space as well, the, the need for chemical, mechanical, and industrial engineers is very strong, and um, you know, it, it's just a, a constant, you know, I think with the evolution of a lot of industries that we're seeing nationally and in Connecticut, um, the businesses are trying to get the talent uh, that they need to sort of move their business product along, and so that often is not an early talent entrant, it is someone that has some uh, level of experience. Um, we do not, uh, statewide in our organization, we really aren't in a role to place anybody at mid-level. Um, there's a variety of organizations that can assist, um, but that's, that's, you know, that's a professional that's been in the workforce for 10, 20 years, and, and, and that's sort of a well-defined marketplace. Um, so we do help to, um, connect to recruiters or organizations based on their industry that, that have those um, relationships with, uh, with that uh, sort of level of, of um, worker. Uh, recently, Patricia and I met with a, a small regional bank 
um, with an interesting um, uh, sense on, and this would play in the tech area, but um, with uh, the recent sort of mergers and activities on the banking side, um, a lot of the banks that had provided very um, uh, professional development training programs within their organization are no longer doing that. And, you know, as banks are becoming more, um, you know, it's, it's, you're not, you don't have sort of the regional deployment uh, that you used to have. So there's a, a lack of training that's being done at a, that's missing at the employer level. So trying to solve for that is, is definitely um, an interesting component of what's happening uh, in terms of evolution of the business cycle. We've been there before, but, but again, it is still very real. Um, and then, you know, and then, you know, we also have requests for welders. They need welders right away. And so our job and with working with Alicia is having these relationships to the regional sector partnerships, to the universities, to the technical high schools, and to the you know the state university and the college system um, about where we can plug individuals in. Since they are smaller employers, um, it is difficult to create a, a curriculum you know bespoke for them. So that's always a challenge. So it's trying to figure out um, what programs would get them. Um, the level of, of, of uh, work that they need. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, happy to, to share. To share. Absolutely, thank you. I think this we have a lot of same themes coming up in the in the regional sector partnerships. So Patricia, maybe you could talk a little bit about what's next in the Southwest Regional Sector Partnerships plans to build out tech talent pathways, particularly using the Good Jobs Challenge money. And what role do you see some of our TTA programs playing in that process? Um, so recently, um, the, the fine folks at the Business Higher Education Forum uh, delivered a skills gap analysis for us, <laughs> um, which is a central part of one of our grant deliverables, um, but really will define the work that we do in um, uh, developing ways to have people access the uh, grant funds that we have for training. So our goal from the skills gap analysis is to identify those in-demand jobs, the skills that are needed in them, the employers that are looking for those uh, folks, and um, having an outreach campaign um, to uh, in individuals interested in entry-level roles within um, companies in the region. Um, and we're also interested in thinking about the incumbent worker uh, opportunities. Um, the grant money, anybody who's involved in federal grants know that they are very particular about what type of person needs to uh, have as their um, situation in order to access the fund. So we need to be um, cognizant of incumbent worker training, not just to have it for skills development, but to have it for wage progression. Um, so anywhere there's an opportunity to skill up uh, incumbent workers into new roles or into roles where they earn um, a higher wage, um, that's something that could be funded uh, by, the, by the grant. So we're, we're looking at those two um, avenues for um, training and placement. Um, so our engagement with businesses um, really has to focus on those that are looking to hire. Um, that's currently our goal, but it's not necessarily the only goal we'll ever have when it comes to tech talent, pipeline development. Um, as I said earlier, I think really creating an environment where partners are being collaborative and sharing information um, and knowing where to access um, the subject matter experts that inform the curriculum, that inform the opportunities for internship, all of those things are sort of, this is a means to that end. Um, in, in really cultivating a space where we're sharing information and, and actively participating in the development of a workforce. Fantastic. And I think you have an RFQ out now, um, seeking training yeah. providers. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and what you're looking for. Yeah, so um, we have a co-convening partner, which is the Workplace. They're our workforce board. They're based in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. Um, they have an RFQ that has been posted, um, but it will also be reposted quarterly. Um, instead of an RFP for training, they just decided to go down an RFQ route just to be to maintain some nimbleness and flexibility. Um, the skills gap analysis didn't uh, get delivered until February, and so as we digest that information and connect with uh, training partners to um, connect with the in-demand jobs, 
that'll be their areas of focus, but as things evolve, they'll be able to add um, additional training partners to it. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about sort of the outcomes of the skills gap analysis, if, if that's okay, because I think there's a lot of connectivity between the areas of um, employment, and this is no surprise because of your partner here, helping all of you define your curricular um, objectives or, or paths. Um, cybersecurity is a big piece, software development, um, systems engineers, data analysts, data scientists, um, software developers, I think I said, business intelligence, and computer support are just, uh, computer support positions are the areas that have been identified just kind of on a high level perspective. And so where can tech talent accelerator programs plug in? Happy to have that conversation because we wanna fund the students that are taking these courses. We wanna fund people that are on a pathway um, and we are, are willing and very interested in coming to the table with higher education to determine what that looks like. I know that um, student uh, financial aid varies across institutions um, and needs. Um, where they are in the completion of their degree program might be a factor, but it doesn't mean that we can't have a conversation about how your students can access this funding in order to take the Tech Talent Accelerator courses. Thank you. So let's say um, all of your graduates come out with some really important and in important skills in emerging areas, we want them to stay in Connecticut. So Patricia Zajac, can you talk a little bit about Campus CT and how um, student retention plays a piece in this puzzle in terms of the state's workforce development strategy? Yes, yeah, so I'll start off by talking a little bit about Campus CT and what it is. Um, so Campus CT is an initiative of the Governor's Workforce Council and it's led by Advanced CT. Um, and so really this, this initiative was started because we saw that we're having struggles with retaining college students in the state of Connecticut. And um, really to get this going, we have started it with, with Advanced CT and with two objectives. One, to promote entry level positions and internships to the students, so getting those opportunities in front of their eyes and two, to promote the lifestyle in Connecticut as a cool place to live, right? Because as we know, they like to flee to other places. So, um, um, so those are two main objectives of Campus CT. Um, and we really communicate all of this to the students through our great partnerships with the uh, colleges and universities in the state, some of the places that are represented today. Um, we have uh, a database of about 52,000 <laughs> 52, emails across the state of Connecticut from colleges like Western, Connecticut State University, Eastern, Southern, UConn, um, Mitchell College. And um, this has really allowed us to put our employer partners um, in front of the students. And so, um, um, so to get into the question and, and, and to see you know, why it's important is really because we, we need to um, market Connecticut as a place for students to stay, right? So with the age of social media and everyone wants to travel and go to these cool places, we need to change that perception for the students. And that's not only because they have to live here, but they also have to work here. So um, with our employer partners, you know, we, we we send out a weekly email to the students and each employer partner gets a spotlight where they get to talk, where we talk a little bit about them and express their, their opportunities and we get that exposure to, to the students. Um, and just a little bit about our growth, um, we are in our third year right now with Campus CT. This past summer we completely rebranded and restructured the entire program. And so this past fall, there was kind of that, you know, new re that new brand that we had to teach the students and really um, get them engaged. And so we saw great growth um, even from our first newsletter for the spring semester. Um, so we're really looking to, um, and, and we got so many clicks and open rates and, and people applying to our jobs um, that are posted by our employer partners. So that, that is, just showing that interest, you know. Um, we went from a 1.8% open rate in the 
an average of 1.8% open rate in the fall to our first newsletter having 7% 7, 7 open rate, which is a great difference. And I can't tell you what 7% of 52,000 emails is, <laughs> but it's a lot, I think. Um, so that's just showing that we're, we're, we're getting there. And so um, for us, we're, while we're still getting that new brand, that name out there, we need tech jobs. You know, we have great employers right now, but we don't have any tech jobs on there, um, on our career portal. So, you know, if, if you guys are looking to promote any tech opportunities, and this is for the employers here, um, we welcome that. You know, we allow you to post internships for free on our platform. And then there's also corporate sponsorship levels, um, champion and, and advocate sponsorship levels where you can really um, join in and get that exposure. Um, and then we, we also thank our university partners for getting us out there to their students, whether it's forwarding our information and our jobs or um, providing us with their emails to really get that, that, that eye level exposure to the students. Awesome, thank you. So being mindful of the time, I wanna give you all a chance to ask our panelists any questions you have, but perhaps each of you could leave us with um, one idea for a best practice for the grantees partnerships or one way that they can um, work with you all to, to continue to scale the good work happening in this room. And whoever has an idea first can go first. <laughs> yes, Patricia. <laughs> Um, I think there's an opportunity for co-promotion. You know, I think about the the work that's being done to develop curriculum within um, your universities, and um, you know, from the from the first time I saw that list and and what you're working on, all I can think about is who knows about this and how can we get them connected. Now, if your program is focused on your students, your currently enrolled students, then that becomes kind of a smaller pool. But if your program is interested in um, having um, enrollment come from um, professionals that want to take these classes. I think the University of Bridgeport's uh, idea is a great one in having something that works outside of the academic system in that way. Um, we can help promote it to our membership, you know, the, the companies that are in our, our region. Um, because I think that the, the continued development, either at a personal level or at an, at a, an employer level, is something that is still very much uh, there's a lot of interest in that, right? Employers want to retain their employees by giving them continued opportunities for growth. And so if we can help promote your programs um, to our membership, that's something that I'd be very interested in, in helping with. And the same, I think um, one thing that is interesting, so, so they're businesses, right? They're small businesses, they're, they're cranking it out. Uh, we even find just in terms of letting them know what's available for them at the state level, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, our really primary role is to help them navigate what they can um, find within the state to help them. So I know there are plans for, for a larger portal, like, you know, in my journey, this is where I'm going to start and this is where I, where I can go to get me to the next point. Um, as, as this grows, we are extremely um, um, ready to assist in terms of getting this information out there. Um, it, it's all very new. Um, so trying to figure out um, how to be able to point someone to certificate programs that are you know, being born sort of uh, um, very nimbly, which is important, we're not often aware of because it's not, um, you know, it's not within our, our you know, immediate access point. So trying to, I think if I had an ask, it would be, you know, you know, we really want to be able to get the word out there to the employers about what you have. So how that can happen, we're very, very happy to talk about and, and move forward. So if that's helpful. Yeah, and, and going a little bit off Lisa's point, um, at Advanced CT, um, because Camp CT has Advanced CT, uh, we have tried to uh, start an initi initiative of incorporating some research into um, our newsletters as well. So doing industry spotlights even, kind of focusing on, on what's needed and then using the, in, the research from Advanced ET um, to really support that. And so I'm just thinking generally, you know, as we look to do a tech, tech spotlight, um, we are really happy to, to promote any educational, you know, resources for the students. Um, and especially, you know, even if 
they don't get our emails directly, you know, the schools that we partner with, they, they forward on our information. So we, we're happy to share that information and, um, and really get that exposure and, and get that in front of the students as well. Thank you all so much. Okay. Well, let's give our panelists a nice round of applause. Thank you so much for being here. And we'll pass it off to the Nebby team to close us out.